This is kind of a... Alright, this is a bit of a take two on a reaction-like video to this video. I already watched it, so I already know what's going to be talked about and stuff, so I've, I have a bit of an organized plan for what I want to talk about or bring up. I, I did record a reaction to this, but I accidentally bumped my external hard drive while recording it, causing the data to be corrupted, so I'm doing a second shot at this. Um, I tried to record it in nicer audio conditions. That's not working right now, because it's not recognizing my Bluetooth headphones, and my only other option are speakers, because I was trying to record on my Steam Deck in my closet for best audio reverb. So we're going to settle for recording it on my laptop which is why there's going to be more reverb, because there's not enough space for my laptop in my closet. So, let's get through it. Uh, it's just an opening little bit explaining what he, he's... He's pulling exclusively from the games, the wiki, and Reddit comments, pretty much, for, like, thoughts on this. Now, I will say, my first issue is he is not using the survival logbook in this video. Uh, and I feel like you have to use... And I know it's game only, so I get it, but... The survival logbook is a game in its own way. It is an activity book, so... And, and that's different from every other book in the series. So I feel like you could cheat it in there, and it also is part of the game continuity. So I'm mixed on use of it, because I feel like the... I guess, yeah, if you're saying it's a game-only thing, then yeah, fine. Where's Rise? We begin with two business moguls, William Afton and someone who goes by the codename HRY223. Uh, I personally refer to him as Henry, even though this is the more correct way to refer to him as. Without the book, we don't have the name Henry, so he is just HRY. Uh, and there's enough character differences where, honestly, HRY might be the better name even considering the books. Because, yes, he is Henry's friend and presumably business partner who makes the animatronics. And his daughter is killed by Henry, and but that's kind of where their similarities end. Henry's daughter becomes an android in the books and does not possess the puppet. Uh, she may possess Ella, I think it's El the Ella doll, but not the puppet, like not the one we know as. So like the, the, the Charlotte's too different in the book to really call the puppet one in the games, Charlie. And HRY's personality and role is too different from Henry's, other than the loose archetype. But yeah, that I I feel like even in a non-game exclusive timeline, HRY is the better. They each have their own separate ventures, but eventually they collaborate on the restaurant Fredbear's Family Diner, a restaurant with state-of-the-art spring lock suits, allowing otherwise robotic performers to be worn by employees to walk around the pizzeria. They can be very dangerous, and if overused or wet, the spring locks inside can snap shut, crushing whoever is inside. It's kind of ambiguous, honestly, what the spring locks do to you, because in the games, we've never seen a true Springlock failure, because in night four of uh, Sister Location, we just get jump scared by the, what? Mini Arenas. So we don't actually know what they do. Do they skewer you? Do they crush you? It, it's always kind of been ambiguous what the game version of Springlocks kill you with. Because it's the a little star animatronics at Fredbear's Family Diner was Fredbear and Spring Bonnie, both created by HRY223, and they saw meteoric success. So much so that they event- okay. <laughs> that's actually a cool thing. I misheard him the first time as mediocre success, but no, mediocre created an offshoot restaurant, mostly comprised of the side characters from Fredbear Family Diner. It was called Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, and starred Freddy Fazbear, Chica, Bonnie, and Foxy. William Afton had a sizable family. Himself, pres- Help wanted models are such a disparity of quality, Chica, because like- Bonnie, and Foxy. These guys all look pretty damn good. They all just look like different, like- uses of the original model. William Afton had a sizable family. Himself, presumably a wife we don't see, his youngest son, his oldest son Michael, and his middle daughter Elizabeth. It still bugs me that we don't have- so I am going to be editing this video on like the f game theory reaction because I realized that was kind of a missed opportunity. Uh, I'm going to put up on screen now my adjusted Michael sprite to make him more similar to his siblings and his other appearances. Because this specific sprite is the only time he has this darker skin tone. In FNAF 4's other jump scares, he has the lighter skin tone, and in Sister Location, he has the lighter skin tone. And that's a meme of, uh, can Michael really be him if his skin tone changed, or white boyification of Michael between games, which... 
no, this is just a weird sprite that's different from every other sprite of Michael. All we know about HRY223's family is that he had a daughter. William is lost in his work. To remedy this, he creates a bunker in between his house and Fredbear's family diner, such so that he can keep an eye on things going around, operate the animatronics, and still watch over his children. In particular, his youngest son, who's- This might be a bit debatable, but I do agree that I'm pretty sure the bunker- This bunker room exists pre-Sister Location's rental service, mainly because this poster is the only thing that indicates it would be a circus babies thing. Everything else is like just a generic kind of lab hallway system. Who seems to have some trouble socially. He created these Fredbear plushes to be able to talk. There's psychic friend Fredbear I'll have you know. I talk really to hope throughout. that if this plush is ever, ever officially produced as the, like the, not, I'm not talking about a Fredbear plush. I mean this plush, the specific one with the darked out eyes staring at you. I really hope it gets named Psychic Friend Fredbear. Throughout the day, as the Fredbear, and seeing as the son does see the characters as his friends. However, even though the son considers the characters friends, he's terrified of the animatronics. And that's a great point, because this is a common misconception that he's afraid of Freddy's or something like that. But, if you think about it, he can't be afraid of anything other than the characters, given the context. Because if he saw... If some people think, oh, he saw Charlie's death, and that's what he's afraid of. The issue is, shouldn't he be afraid of going outside or being locked out or his dad or being murdered outside Freddy's? That's not what he's afraid of. He's afraid of the suits. He likes the characters. He even seems to like Freddy's itself because he doesn't freak out around the TV show when the TV show is drag. And what also supports the idea that he's afraid of the care, like the suits, the physical suits, the Springlock suits, is the line... What's seen in shadows is easily misunderstood in the mind of a child, and the only shot of shadows are the springlock suits and William putting someone into his springlock suit. Those are the only two things that are in shadows in the minigames. And both of those are the springlock suits, which only prove the point that he's afraid of these suits for how dangerous they are. Most likely due to him seeing a worker being put into a springlock suit. In the eyes of a child, that looks crazy. William knows he has this fear, so he feeds into it a little bit to keep him away from the springlock suits. Although it backfires, and now the child is terrified of all things animatronic. A fact that his older brother seems to tease him relentlessly about. In fact, the other children- What's interesting is, one of the differences is between Pete and Michael, character-wise, between the, the universes. Pete's a little bit more genuinely aggressive with his younger brother than Michael is. If you look at Michael's behavior, he's like, he's not really be being aggressive. Like, it's not like he's mad at the crying child. It's more like he's just making fun of him. Which is a difference in motive, which is why I bring it up. Children around town tease him for the same thing. Like, one like I said, it's, it's teasing that goes too far rather than I'm genuinely mad and upset at you unfortunate day, the bullying goes too far. Michael Afton and a few of his friends pick up the youngest son, bring him over to the Fredbear animatronic, and place his head in the mouth of it. What began as a- Also, uh, Michael's writing here. We'll go into the couch person a little later, but I want to keep in mind how snarky and jokey he is, because this is not like a one-off thing. It's not like he stopped being like this after four. He laughs in Sislocation when He's like, they thought I was you. And then he like stops for a breath and then continues, which I think is supposed to be him laughing, but with the weird kind of auto-tuning he has, it sounds a little weird. They thought I was you. <laughs> and more importantly, the survival logbook is pretty damn snarky. He is. Like, this is a consistent characterization, which is not how couch person ends, but since it's on screen, no. A mean-spirited tease turned fatal because Fredbear's jaw clamped shut due to either the animatronic programming or the tears causing the spring locks. Oh, I missed that in my first reaction. He says either the animatronic programming or the spring locks. It could be either, honestly. Uh, I feel like it is just the animatronic itself is just fundamentally too powerful and bulky or whatever. Whatever. I know that's a weird powerful implies power scaling or something. I just mean like it's physically just a really bulky advanced suit. Because the spring locks doesn't make sense because it's, it's in animatronic mode, which kind of contradicts it being the spring locks, but... Inside, 
to clamp. The youngest son is brought home and put on an IV drip, laying in bed in a coma. Michael apologizes to him while he's in this state. William promises to put him back together, but so far he has no idea how. Fred Bears gets shut I down. Like to think and the, that spring the color change is because Michael is because William's there in person and stops doing his Fred Bear voice. Because I, I like to think he's like. Don't you remember what you see? Not that that's what Fredbear sounds like, but that kind of like he's doing a character voice for the bite victim. And then that last line, the I know it's an accident, but I, this is kind of my personal I can is that's William stopping doing the voice to make the promise himself. Lock suits are moved to a safe room in the Freddy Fazbear's Pizza location. To prevent more accidents like this, HRY creates the security puppet, something to watch over his and daughter. And that's also something is Charlie being the first victim is really weird. Because the security puppet's a way more extreme measure than anything we see in FNAF 4. Nothing in FNAF 4 implies an incident has already happened. But the security puppet implies there's something that Henry decided was worth making a safety system for. It's worth noting that Charlie ends up kill being killed by bullying, and that's part of the thing that the security puppet's kind of keeping track of, it seems, with the bracelets, is who's where, what's where, why is where for all the kids. So that, that implies something's happened by the time Charlie dies. And the only incident that doesn't kind of rely on another incident to make sense is uh, FNAF 4, where, where the victim is the only character who can die with no outside factors informing his death. Because it is just a freak accident. You don't need stuff like, why does William kill Charlotte? Well, he needs to have something happen to him to make him do that, other than just he's sadistic and a psychopath. And the missing children's incident is obviously after Charlie dies because she's the one who ends up putting them in the suits and giving them life. And that's exactly how it's shown to us. There's no arguing or cheating around that. I, I know sometimes people try to like, oh, what if they die first and were given life later? But it's like, that is such a convoluted workaround that doesn't even fit what we're shown really because it's like that implies the missing children as it happens in like 1980 which it's never been implied that freddy's existed at that point because it's stated that freddy fazbear's pizza was found in 1983 regardless of fred bears so it would have to be like earlier in the year of fight that fort which is so convoluted and stupid that i just can't accept that as a logic or an argument like that requires so many assumptions and stuff to make that work like the amount of stuff that would have to happen to make the missing children's hands before anything else is so contrived and convoluted and it all hinges on that one Susie line of i was the first i saw everything but I really feel like that was just supposed to tell us that she was the first of the MCI kids to be killed. But anyway. Specifically, but also just to keep the children safe. The Fred Bears that closed yeah. down gets bought up and turned into a bar called Junior's. William be That's an interesting take on that. I missed that the first time. I'm glad I'm rewatching this. And safe. The Fred Bears that closed down gets bought up and turned into a bar called Junior's. William begins to drink. <laughs> that, where the hell did that come from? I mean, I don't mind that explanation. It would explain why it's so close to his house. But, like, that is so out of nowhere. I mean, like I said, I don't mind it. It works, but there's no evidence for that. Other than it's generally geographically similar to where Fredbear's would be. I do think, regardless of what Junior's is, William's descent into madness has to start here. Timeline-wise, like, this has to be where William starts breaking and falling apart. Think, falling into a drunken stupor. He starts to lose himself, wants to somehow right the wrongs that were done to his son, and eventually, the youngest son dies, and that sends William over the edge. He wants revenge for his son, but William can't do that so long as the security puppet remains there. He knows that HRY would never take down the security puppet, but in his eyes, this is the second time that HRY has wronged him. First, by creating the machine that killed his son, and second, by denying... Okay, I want you to keep in mind this take down the security puppet concept because I'll expand upon it later with proof for something we're going to get into very soon. ...him his rightful vengeance. Drunkenly, he drives to the Freddy Fazbear... I love this reverse shot to do it. Uh, I feel like if I would have done it, I would have uh, rotated the screen to make it look like he was driving around like this way. ...pizza, and he and sees HRY's daughter locked outside. Taking the opportunity and knowing the security puppet would eventually chase after her, he kills her, leaving her in the alleyway and drunkenly driving home. The security puppet does eventually inch its way towards her in the rain, short circuits, and collapses on her. 
It's at this moment that HRY's daughter possesses the puppet. William then drives home. His wife warns him to keep away from his eldest son, Michael. Okay, so this person, couch person, um, I do think that somewhere along the development this became Miss Afton, but Scott's really weird with his file names at times and his sprite names. Uh, the first kind of oddity was Golden Freddy's just called Yellow Bear. He's not called Yellow Freddy, he's not called Golden Freddy, because, I mean, God, Golden Freddy's always a family name. He's not called Fred Bear or anything, he's just Yellow Bear. And then in FNAF 2, the puppet was just Sock Puppet was its name. And I'm like, there's no way in hell that thing's a sock puppet. And also in FNAF 2, uh, the kid outside the window who becomes the puppet, before we knew who they were, the audio specifically spells out save him, which it was retconned later to be save her, because it's Henry's daughter. So Scott's really weird about... And also, oh, another thing in FNAF 2 specifically, this is infamous now, but... Mangle is referred to as Ladies' Night. She and has lipstick, whereas the other male characters with the kind of rosier, more feminine designs typically don't have lipstick. Uh, like Funtime Freddy doesn't, but Funtime Foxy does. But Funtime Foxy is kind of riffing on Mangle. But point being, at the time, that was like beyond just the white and pink. That's a pretty feminine color scheme and character design by tropes. And also, they are in, lady, in, in Ladies' Night. But Phone Guy says he. Which, to me, either implies that that was f New Foxy's whole deal early in development, was that they were just a, a New Foxy, or Scott genuinely just fumbled the gender. Uh, and arguably, I think something similar happened in UCN. So, the one you should not have killed is only ever given a gender once, and that's from Wither Chica, where she pretty clearly says, I have seen him, the one you should not have killed. But every other time they're ever mentioned is them. Which is weird, because that implies Scott... Uh, that implies the script was flubbed to me, because why only once would it ever be meant? Like, shouldn't they all be saying him if that was what we were supposed to get out of it? So I think that a lot of times Scott's scripts or writings tend to lean towards male characters and or just first drafts and impulses. And I bring that up because this sprite's named Man Sitting. And if there wasn't such a history of weird sprite names and all that, I would I would take that very seriously. And the other issue is, or the other thing is, even if this is a man sitting, it probably isn't Michael because Michael's a teenager at this point, or even younger, maybe like thirteen-ish, uh, enough to be to have a baby brother as it's worded. while also having him here so he isn't there to catch him killing Charlie. Um, that is my alternative if this is not Miss Afton. Because this is not Michael no matter what. I will firmly stand by that. Uh, Michael doesn't talk like this, and this has been firmly established at this point, in both si in Sister Location and 4, he doesn't talk like this. So even without the survival log, this dialogue's so out of character for him. And yeah, I know real brothers can change morality all the time. But this is not a real person. This is a fictional character in a story. And one of his defining traits is how he bullies his younger brother. So for the alt... The, I'm going to call it the game theory version, which is just the popularized version of it. Or this is Michael on the couch and crying child running away. That is so out of character for both of them. It is absurd. Like, I know you can't use... I, I know some people thought, oh, you can't use character analysis. But I'm like... The crying child's only defining personality traits are is being scared of things and breaking down crying. Like, even in the survival logbook, that he, one of the only things he says is, I'm scared. Like, he is a helpless little kid, and we're supposed to assume he's smashing a window to run off from his angry, alcoholic dad? Like, that is so... not right for his character. Also, the fact that, like... A less than eight-year-old is doing that is absurd in general. Teen, 13-ish range. And it's a baby brother. Like, you really... It has to be, like, five or more years difference. So, anyway. That that just bugged me. 
the, there's no way in hell this is my goal of character writing. Well. As he's had a rough day, but he demands to see his son. His son that's being kept in by a station animatronic outside. It doesn't do much, but he's hopeful that the sight of it will be enough to keep him inside and scare him in bed. But when he goes around back to check the window, he finds it broken and just footprints left behind. The animatronic didn't work, and Michael snuck off to that place again. The Mound in the Woods, the entrance to William's secret bunker. William wants to keep him away from there for several reasons. Uh, this is the first part where I'm like, eh, I don't really agree with that argument and logic. So, it just doesn't, there it just isn't a reason for Michael to run off to the bunker in general. That doesn't fit cleanly enough to me to be like the definitive thing. I, if I were writing the script, I would have just said that place again, which is, amb and I would have given the possibilities of what it is. I feel like it just doesn't seem like to, to me that this is definitively the bunker. It controls so much, it has cameras everywhere, but obviously the animatronic outside his window didn't work. So when he comes back, he'll make him sorry by moving him into a room without windows and without doors that lock. And he begins tormenting him every night from that bunker, unlocking the access to the- It is an interesting thing that William specifically mad at him locking the door and him running on the window and the FNAF 4 room doesn't have either, which reinforces it's Michael's room. Animatronics that, that and cameras with the continuity. code 1983. The very year that his youngest son died, partially from- Now it is ambiguous what the hell FNAF 4 is. The hands wise. of his oldest son. Note, I want to be clear, this isn't the FNAF 4 gameplay. I think William is doing this with the animatronics that he already has. However, these actions do create the FNAF 4 gameplay, because this torment that he puts Michael through gives Michael long-standing nightmares from here on out, where he relives these experiences even when not sleeping there, with nightmarish, illusionary versions of the animatronics Which that is reinforced by the survival log, but even though he's not using that. And in general, it's also kind of implied by the games where FNAF 4 perfectly mirrors FNAF 1's gameplay loadout, but applied to the room he had as a kid. Uh, that's just a very solid... Like, that, that's... That's too specific of a connection where it's like... And also, like I said, he draws Nightmare Fredbear in sort of a logbook, implying he's met that. And that makes him the only confirmed character who's met Nightmare Fredbear until UCN. And granted, that's just a variant of Nightmare Fredbear because it's implied that they're like... I'm pretty sure you, UCN's supposed to be recreations of everything. Uh, I don't think... Because I don't think every character there has a spirit to be brought in. Like, I, I'm pretty sure Trash and the Gang aren't possessed. And I don't think the me Mediocre Melodies are possessed either. Or Music Man. Uh, and also, two different Aftons. And also, <laughs> you get the... Actually, that, that, I can leave it there. Two different babies, several different Freddies, and all that. Uh, I'm pretty sure that they're all supposed to be, like, reminders of everything William's done, rather than literally the spirits or animatronics doing any of it. So the only person who's met the real Nightmare Fredbear, whatever that is would be Michael, uh, to our knowledge. Reinforcing that he's the Now, with no board. obstacles, William takes his revenge. He dons the spring bonnie suit, even though management specifies that it's unsafe, and he begins leading children into the safe room. The first with Susie as she's playing Fruity Maze, and he convinces her that her dog actually isn't dead, and that he's in the back room. She was then stuffed into the Chica animatronic. Then, in no no- I like to think Fruity Maze is like a representation of her breaking down while playing the game. Like, she's trying to distract herself by having fun at a pizzeria, but it just isn't working. ...order. The same is done to Gabriel and to Freddy, Fritz and to Foxy, Jeremy... Now, this is another part I'm going to kind of disagree on, sort of, because it's... It's unclear if this has been retconned, or this is just a long-standing misunderstanding. So, in FNAF 2, we are specifically shown that it looks like the puppet's the one putting all the characters into the suits. And also in FNAF 2... That group of kids are just left around the building and not stuffed. So that implies to me that William was not consciously stuffing animatronics, like stuffing the kids in the suits. Um, if he was hiding them, he was hiding hiding them in the back room or in the safe room. So I feel like if anything, that's what's going on there. I don't really agree with. Uh, the concept that William stuffed them himself. Because that's such an arbitrary and random thing for him to do. Even if he's hiding the bodies, that's so... Like, God, there's got to be better ways to do it.
Hermie into Bonnie and another unnamed child into the only suit that's sort of a logbook there on left so. hanging around the very no same suit that. that his son was killed by the Fredbear suit at this point the police begin snooping around I mean five children have gone missing to throw them off the trail and to cover his own tracks and in one final act of this is something that I don't fully disagree with and I don't fully agree with because I I feel like there's just enough evidence to make this connection but not enough to make it canon or like something I personally would put in a timeline. Revenge. Video. William frames HRY223 for the five missing children. <laughs> I'm going to dub over Henry. Okay. Just they that. never find the body, but according to the newspapers, a suspect was convicted. HR. Well, what's weird is, uh, well, the suspect has been charged and then it's kind of contradicted there. Why 22? Two. Charged and convicted are two different things. And then VR says nothing was ever proven in the court of law. So it's really weird to say whether anyone was convicted Three. or not. goes to prison, and the whole ordeal becomes known as the Missing Children Incident, going down in Fazbear infamy. Freddy Fazbear's- uh, I do want to cover that some people try to argue, oh, the kids were lured at separate days because the one poster says two kids were seen being lured back to the back. The issue is, the way it's phrased to me implies that- because they're talking about a man was seen taking two kids to the back in a costume, which just means Exactly that. That on camera, what they caught was someone taking two kids back. But then they say, in a later poster, it's implied that they f figured out that three other kids had went missing after they had seen two kids on camera. It is not presented as two kids died and then later three kids died because it says specifically that it was all done on June 26th. Uh, which I had a, a theory that I really liked. It was really cool about June 26th and its significance. And then I... Then the damn paychecks kind of ruined it. Because I was going to imply that William tries to kill people on June 26th every year. Because that was going to be the... Because that would be the hypothetical date the bike victim died. It didn't hold up because that didn't match up with FNAF 2's time period at all where more kids die so that that theory fell apart but i really liked it but anyway that was just a side point and also like i said all kids die on june 26th so and that's inarguable that's how it's presented this closes down and it's at this point that hry's daughter via the puppet starts to shepherd the souls of those five children into the stuffed in so that they can continue to live in some form and not be lost but william starts to notice this he sees the suits twitching and moving around Radically. I feel like the, the, his behavior starts when he sees the puppet doing the stuff. And that's why he kills the second batch. Because I don't think Raitos explains why William kills the second batch. Suddenly, he has a lead on how he might be able to bring his own son back. But he needs... I think... To me, the, the MCI in the modern context reads as... Uh, William seeing if he can get Charlotte's reanimation to happen again. Because the staff are aware the puppet can move. Phone guy says, oh, that puppet thing, it's always thinking it can go anywhere. Which heavily implies the staff are aware the puppet is not normal and or potentially possessed. So I think what FNAF 1, or FNAF 0 is now framed as, the original Freddy's, is William seeing if he can get it to happen again. And then, as he'll go into later, FNAF 2 is him, is William experimenting with, can I control or specify this more? He needs to experiment more. He needs more test subjects. He opens up Freddy Fazbear's Pizza again, but this time to help with PR and investors, he creates state-of-the-art toy animatronics with facial recognition systems, things that can scan to make sure criminals stay out. Notably, William isn't on any criminal database, but HRY is. He wants to see if he can- That is one of the things that would make me more inclined to that Henry being HRY, or, or being convicted. Because that would explain why he's why the toy amtronics are so different than any of the amtronics uh, Henry has supposedly worked on. Because if you look at it, like if you compare the rock stars who are very similar in theming to the toys, who are heavily implied to be made by him, considering that Lefty is the exact same style and model, uh, and we know Henry made uh, Lefty, uh, that heavily implies that. Like, he has his own design works, and they are not what the toy animatronics are. 
take this possession effect and transfer it. So he uses parts from the old animatronics that are possessed and puts them into the toy animatronics. I do heavily agree with that's why they're retrofitting something borrowed, something new. Like this teaser implies that and also that explains why the toys are active before anything happens is they are reusing parts. Like that's stated by Funga, they're reusing parts from the old ones to repair the new ones. Uh, and I think that is supposed to be William seeing if he could get these animatronics to live with the parts, but, but they're not active enough. So he kills the second batch to basically make them more active, and that's what happens on Night 6, which is different from how Raito's interpreted it, but we'll get there. It's a rudimentary form of remnant injection, which we will get into. Attempting to lay low, he gets a job at the pizzeria as a night shift worker, but quickly transfers to the day shift. Here is where the gameplay of FNAF 2 begins, and we see the perspective of a worker recently slotted into William's old position as things start to go wrong. As William continues to tamper with these animatronics, putting more pieces of the old animatronics in them, they become more erratic, more violent. The facial recognition system starts to glitch and not work correctly. Eventually, it gets too dangerous for even William, so he puts on the spring bonnie suit to try to control them. And at that point... I don't agree with that interpretation. I think when phone guy says someone use a suit, a yellow one, uh, and then he goes and talks about how there's an investigation, the place will be shut down more and more, and how they only have one day left, I think implies that William, on night six, or preceding night six, kills his next batch uh, of kids. Can I say, what the hell is with this one image of Freddy? With, like, the drawn-on teeth? And, like, this uh, drawn-on outline? What's the deal with that? The, the, it is drawn on. That is not what actual FNAF 2 Freddy looks like. In that in that specific poster and image. I'll put it on screen. I'm looking at it now. Yeah, that is not how the normal image looks. That's funky. I don't know what that's about, but anyway. They go haywire. The pizzeria has to shut down and an investigation begins. At this point, the heat is too high and William flees. The phone guy warns us, the player, that there's one more scheduled party and asks us to just go to day shift and keep an eye on the animatronics to make sure that they don't hurt anyone. But we can't control anything. And that party results in the dead child incident, where the toy animatronics, fully corrupted, lash out, and five children die at the pizzeria. It's dirt. I don't agree with that interpretation at all. Uh, I can see it working, and I can even see a timeline where it's correct, but I don't think that's what Scott was actually implying. I think the idea is that one just kills his next batch. Because the toys are just cleanly on stage in this minigame, which just doesn't fit to me with this explanation and logic. I feel like if that was supposed to be our explanation that we got away from this. Because the, the toy and trunks don't hurt kids. That is specifically saying that they're fine around kids, but they just stare at adults. Let me double check the phone guy calls, because I, I don't want to say that and then have phone guy be like, and now they're even attacking kids. It's never implied in FNAF 2 that the animatronics are inherently dangerous to kids. In fact, it's specifically specified they aren't. Because the only time phone guy ever implies that the unstable version of the animatronics or dangerous to kids, he says to anyone. But I think that's referring to the parents of the kids, because that's what's stated, is that they freak out around parents. During this party that the Bite of 87 happens, the FNAF 2 location shuts down, the toy animatronics- Uh, and, and that is a convenient explanation for, like, the Bite of 87, but I- Tronics are scrapped, I don't but the old ones are held on to. As tragic as an event as that was, William learned that he was right. Moving metal that has soul attached to it into a new piece of machinery transfers the soul with it. He just needed to find out the perfect way to recreate that. If he could do that, he could try to transfer the Fredbear suit that killed his son into something and see if he could recreate his son, finally putting him back together. And I do he think that is the point of the whole... Uh, that is, I, in my opinion, that's inarguably the point of the scoopers, to see if you can put one thing in another thing and swap it around. Creates the fun times to accomplish this goal. They were designed specifically to kidnap children. That way he could get new test subjects to recreate the missing child incident and then try to transfer one from time to another. But before he could ever truly test that out, 
the worst possible outcome occurred. During one of the test performances right before the restaurant opened up for real, his own daughter Elizabeth snuck off and got alone with Circus Baby. Circus Baby went to kidnap her, but something went wrong and she kills her instead. Elizabeth goes on to possess Circus Baby, and the whole idea is scrapped, the fun times being put in the bunker. But William notices the possession that takes place in Circus Baby. He was right. It's doubled down that he is correct, but he needs test subjects. So he goes to the old scrapped toy animatronics that have part of the- This is another part where I'm like a little mixed on this take, because if the fun times are possessed by anything that isn't just their own victims, it does have to be the toy animatronics. Because the FNAF 1 gang are still on their own in FNAF 1, and, and still intact by FNAF 1's events. And uh, by the time you have uh, the Follow Me mini games, uh, they're still intact and fully around. And William dies at the end of those, so it's he physically could never could have gotten the remnant or anything like that from them. Uh, unless you're you would need to make an argument that someone else after William's death went over there, took all the parts, and then used that to experiment with this location crew, which is not implied at all in FNAF. Like, nowhere is that ever implied. I, I, I feel like if they are running on anything other than their own souls, it has to be the toys. Because uh, they are scrapped. They, they, all of their parts would be available to William. I, I don't still fully agree with that premise, but if that... If it's going to be anything like that, it's going to be the toys. No missing child incident souls in them and melts them down into as much metal as he can. He calls that substance remnant, a mixture of a- Technically, if we're going game only, this is some cracks in the theory. Uh, it is not stated that remnant is metal in the games. It is said it's malleable. In fact, it's not even explained what color it is or what it is in general in the games. It is stated that it is malleable. It has to be heated to be just enough to be malleable, but not too far as it damages the spirits and can cause, like, potentially permanent loss of possession. But it is not saved it's metal, so that is something from the books there. A silvery... It's such a nitpicky, that's such a... Liquidish I just want to point out that if you're going far enough to not use Henry or Charlie's names from the books and ignoring the survival logbook, which is canon to the games, uh, I feel like... I'm only doing that because that's something so and that you would only get from He then things. injects it into the three remaining fun times, trying to get some kind of a reaction. And he does. But they're violent and erratic. He took the parts of five souls out from where they were into new things, melted those down into- And the issue is this requires a lot of assumptions about storyline and events. Split it up. That doesn't work. And he knows that now, after using his new invention, the scooper, to inject that remnant into the animatronics. At this point, he needs to just try again. But Elizabeth is still down there, and it's too dangerous for him to go down. Who else does he have to trust, or- Now, my other contradiction to the scooper being proof to that theory is Baby says, I've been out before, but they always put me back. Ballora won't go back anymore, which heavily implies that they're just being taken out and being put back, potentially into new shells or upgraded shells or whatever, or maybe they're just the old shells or whatever. Point being, we know the scooper has been used on these animatronics several, several, several times uh, already. So it's not like it's proof. Like, if there was no lines like that, then we could assume the scooper was meant to take stuff out of old animatronics and put them into the situation crew. But that's not what's being implied. It seems like the scooper is just meant to extract remnant to study it and then put it back when they're done. Uh, potentially, I think that it also serves as an explanation for why the mini arenas follow the Laura's orders and why the Biddy Babs seem to be alive to an extent. Their spirits just split up into all their little minions like Bon Bon and etc. With the exception of Funtime Foxy, all of them have little minion things that serve them. Anyway, I just point out that, that that's, this isn't as or at least can command can. his own son who he tortures on the nightly michael afton he forces him to go down to put elizabeth back together and to free her then we have the gameplay of sister location 
where Michael Lafton tries to do that, no, but instead not. is tricked by Circus Baby and Ennard, an amalgamation of the innards of the fun times, trying to form back into as whole as they can be. Ennard then scoops Michael and uses his skin to escape. It works for a time, but eventually that skin begins to rot, and Ennard has to flee into the sewers. Michael Afton, having trace amounts of remnant left on him from the scooper, and rage and unsettled business in his own soul, possesses himself to go after his father, and pledges to. This is another thing where I feel like this is skipping a detail with the you won't die. Remember, Baby at this point thinks Michael is William. Uh, so I think Baby was consciously using her remnant uh, to keep Will, uh, Michael alive because she wants her dad to live again. Because as we see in 6, she's still on daddy's side. But when William went down to the bunker to see what had happened after the fact, he fled the scene as well, and thus began a chase. William needs Ennard back to continue testing, and to retrieve his daughter. But uh, I also think that at this point, because William has seen zombified Michael or Enderdefied Michael, that might be what causes him to go to FNAF 1, knowing he has, knowing he's pretty much screwed if he has a deal with Enderd. That's kind of how I interpret that, and that's also why by the time Enderd leaves Michael, William's dead. That's how I view it. But and he needs to avoid Michael, kind of who pretty much just wants to kill him. So, he creates a Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, hoping that he effectively caused a fear in Michael that he would stay away, but attract Ennard and Elizabeth. Things that a well, that's building on a lot of assumptions. ...would want to go towards a pizzeria so, where a Fazbear and animatronics now, are. He takes the old animatronics fine. from the FNAF 2 location, and on a shoestring budget, reopens the pizzeria again. It's dirty, it's messy, it's disgusting, frankly, but it's just enough to have the idea of a pizzeria. And he does attract some pretty big players in this plot, but not the ones that he wanted to. Michael Afton comes looking for him, and that marionette possessed by HRY's daughter comes to check as well. The puppet checks on the souls of the old animatronics to see if all is still well, and Michael is just trying to survive and hoping eventually his father might show up. This is the game. I joked in my reaction, but it'd be really funny if the reason Michael sticks around for a week before messing with the animatronics on custom night is just to see if his dad would hand him the paycheck. That would be a very funny explanation under this timeline's logic. Uh, and potentially the other reason is so he could get his pink slip from his dad by tampering the animatronics. That'd be a very funny way Play like, to rationalize one. it. But, but when William realizes right. who he has attracted, he shuts down the restaurant and hopes that they leave. And when they eventually do, he goes to just take apart the old animatronics to get as much remnant out of them as he can. But once he takes them apart, the spirits corner him in a back room, and William, in a fit of desperation, puts on the old Spring Bonnie suit to try to scare them off. The Spring Bonnie suit snaps onto him, crushing him inside. And uh, another thing where the detail's wrong, but the gist is right. So in FNAF 2, it is established that you can scare, you can get past Golden Freddy with the Freddy net. So I think this is operating on similar logic where by putting on something that makes your vision or contact with the spirit indirect, you can escape their wrath. Uh, and that's what I think Gold, I think that's what Spring Bonnie is trying to do, or that's what my, William is trying to do. Uh, because the suit's decrepit and destroyed, it kills him. Killing him. Just he fine. then goes on to possess it, but he's stuck back there. And thus begins a bit of a time skip. Now it's during this time that Circus Baby is eventually kicked out of the Ennard conglomerate. They have an argument again, and look at how blown along this these little scratches and details on and decide that. that she doesn't belong. So now I still stand by the wither ones almost look like decent G mod models. Freddy and Scrap Baby are roaming the sewers. Is this an official render of her? Like, this is a really good render, but I'm not sure if this is the official... Because I don't think there is an official PNG of her. She has been shepherding souls this whole time. She then creates FNAF World to try and facilitate the passing on of these souls. But she needs... Uh... This work... This is one of those... This explanation of works How and it connects the dots. But it doesn't feel definitive. It feels like strands that kind of pull together rather than a chain. William Afton's soul is there and as angry as ever. As she says in Ultimate Custom Night, I don't hate you, but you need to stay out of my way. So the other strongest soul present, Michael, takes up the job. So the other strongest soul present, Michael, takes up the job. So the other strongest soul present, Michael, takes up the job. So the other strongest soul present, Michael, takes up the job.
you know how there's always that part of the theory? You know what I'm talking about. You're looking at a Reddit post or somewhere else. I don't know where else people look at theories. Or you're watching a MatPat video. And then there's that portion. The part that confuses you. The part that makes you wonder, what are they on about? This is the first part I'm like, no, I just think you're objectively wrong here. Because even ignoring the survival logbook, we know there's a fifth kid who dies. We know that Golden Freddy is the one associated with UCN's ending. And, or, like, final cutscene. Uh, and Michael, his connections to Fredbear are so loose and abstract. And also, Michael goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Fredbear. Or, or the point is, Fredbear goes toe-to-toe -to -toe, or Golden Freddy goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with other people. Regardless of whether, who you think Michael is and where he is. Point is, three different night guards have met Golden Freddy. Max two minimum. Because even if Fritz and Mike, Mike Schmidt are both Michael, then Jeremy still met Golden Freddy. And that makes Golden Freddy too relevant and consistent of a spirit to... And also there's the one we see in FNAF 3, which technically isn't explained to be Golden Freddy, but based on the sequencing, it would be so weird if it wasn't. Because then that means what the hell is Golden Freddy doing in the rest of the minigame? The point being, uh, and this is before the bike victim is introduced, so it's even more likely that it's supposed to be Golden Freddy cornering him in, in the Spring and Trap uh, minigame. That connection's been there since 3, and I feel it's just too weird to work around it with ignoring them for Michael to be tormenting Henry. Or not Henry, William. Which narratively is satisfying, it does work. But I don't think that's what the story is implying. Like, that's the issue with things is, no matter how much you may like or find an interpretation fun and interesting, that doesn't make it the correct one. Uh, and that's my issue with this is, I like the idea of Michael tormenting his dad forever with everything that Michael has been through. I like the idea of it doing it, of him doing it so he can cover for Charlotte to free the other souls. Uh, and this would even hypothetically lead into security breach with arguably Glam Michael as Freddy. The issue is, once again, this nixes that entire Golden Freddy shaking cutscene. And also Michael, and this also nixes Cassie's entire role and also the fact that it's a kid's voice. And the fact that, uh, I believe it's Orville who says, oh, no matter how many times they burn us. Which implies that the both the Vengeful Spirit and William have been burned multiple times. And the they implies it was nodding my, William. It was that they, both of them were burned by someone else. Which reinforces my idea of the fire of FNAF 3 is what releases some of the spirits there. But Cassidy's isn't, and then that would follow, I guess, Michael 2 6, for lack of a better term. And that's where they get the chance to get revenge on William after William's soul is loosened or freed or whatever happens there. Uh, or he swarms in a nightmare or whatever's going on with UCN. That, that all tracks, and that's game exclusive logic. Uh,. Because I, I can't see a workaround for Michael being the vengeful spirit with they have a kid's face, which is really weird for Michael. And also, once again, they burned us is the specific wording. Uh, and that line makes no sense as a misread. Like, there's no alternate way to phrase that, really, without having that same context. The no matter how many times just doesn't work with Michael being the one saying that. So, yeah, I, I feel like this is tortures the only part his father is just as wrong, his father had tortured no matter how cool the narrative is. This is a cool hit cannon I don't think it's right. sending animatronic after animatronic after him, ripping him apart in any way he can, reminding him that by sending Michael into the sister location bunker, he may as well have killed him himself. The rationale is also kind of weak cuz it, it it does <coughs> it does just kind of devolve into the same logic as uh, Cassidy's logic of, to me, the, the one you should not have killed is not that the death or murder of this kid was anything special. It's just that they themselves are not going to let William go and that they are choosing not to move on to haunt William. That is all that the one you should not have killed means, in my opinion. 
Because it does, because there literally is no one who has like a unique enough death to warrant this, uh, and have a grudge against William. Because Charlotte specifically says she does not hate William. We also know that it is William, because explicitly because Nightmarion says, "I am the fearful uh, reflection of what you have created," which is the puppet. Because he creates the puppet creature at its core. Even though the secure puppet is built by Henry. Charlie possessing is caused by William, and that's inarguable. That, that's a lot. That's kind of what the logic he's using here is, but more solid and confirmed. And that's, in my opinion, pretty inarguable that it's William being tormented. And the 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 sending Michael to his death is too indirect to feel like it's warrant the one you should not have killed gimmick without it just being Michael's angry. Which is the same logic as what I'm saying about the... The death itself is not as important as much as the... If like the others are going to let you go, I'm not. Sentiment. And Michael is not the one he should have killed. And then Michael spends the foreseeable eternity tormenting William, reminding him of his worst moments in life and his worst mistakes. And that's it. The entire FNAF timeline. If you want my evidence, there's a playlist in the cards and I'll link it at the end of the video. The playlist is like an hour and a half, so grab some popcorn. If for whatever reason you want one of these, we made a few of them, so there's a link in the description to my wife's Etsy shop. You can get them there. We made them ourselves, so uh, there's only a couple. If they run out, maybe we'll figure out a way to do more, but... You know. And if you love charity, don't forget that on January 1st, I, I we'll be doing a 12-hour live stream. Three days from now, it's Sunday, books. essentially. I'll be reading the FNAF books, and there will be milestones, challenges, incentives. It'll be a fun time, and it's all for the Trevor Project. So if you want to hang out, or you're just hungover and want a more laid-back stream to watch, we'll be here. Anyways, I just want to thank you all again so much for everything. This has been probably one of the best years of my life. And Glad most of that is... I, I do love this video. This video is great overall. I just have my nitpicks Ooh, and comments. The people who watch and support this channel, it's allowed so much amazing stuff to happen. And I just want to keep doing what I can to give back as much as I can. A lot of great news on the way. So I'm trying to write to happen if you on the live already. stream. But for now, uh, thank you all so much. I am a, a and an far extra thank you to the wonderful channel. patrons, the toasted slices of the channel Emberisk, Zenith, uh, Raven Eris, Charlie Bean, Lovey Puppy, Stormachow, Just BKZ, Chickpea, Lola Fembo, the Viper 26, Lehan, I may be a lot smaller channel, part. but I do want to support this video. Until next time, have a happy new year. And great. as always, stay tuned. I do feel like the prior one's a little bit better, though. I, I do think his. This one. Uh, or yep. not this one. Let me, let me pull it up. This video, I like a lot more than this one. Uh, I feel like it does a lot of the same things a little bit better. Uh, anyway, that's this video. I'm going to edit it to be a little more polished, bring up visuals as I'm talking with them. That's all. Bye.